to, to Mars and beyond. I don't think it was lost on either uh, vendor that whichever lander was available first to ensure that uh, America achieves its, its strategic objectives on the moon is the one we were going to go with. On his first day as NASA's new administrator, Jared Isaacman made it clear that the agency would choose whichever company finishes its lunar lander first, Elon Musk's SpaceX or Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. Sound familiar? It should. Back in October, then-acting NASA Administrator Sean Duffy reopened SpaceX's lunar lander contract, saying the company was behind schedule. In response, SpaceX told NASA it was proposing a simplified mission to get astronauts back to the moon sooner. So what could this plan be? When people start guessing about a simpler way SpaceX could get to the moon, the first idea that usually comes up is Crew Dragon. And honestly, that makes sense at first glance. It's a proven, reliable spacecraft that's been carrying people around low Earth orbit for years. So the instinct is, why not just use that and go a bit farther? The problem is that a bit farther turns out to be a much bigger jump than it sounds. What makes this so hard is that you're not really removing difficulty, you're just moving it around. Every attempt to simplify the mission just shifts the hardest part to a different place that feels less risky or less controversial. But orbital mechanics doesn't care about vibes or politics. Push in one spot, and the physics pushes back somewhere else. That's why it feels like you keep going in circles instead of landing on a clean solution. At the core of all of this is energy. Getting people from the lunar surface back to Earth safely costs about the same amount of energy, no matter how clever the route looks on paper. You only get real savings when you do burns where velocity is high, which is why low Earth orbit, low lunar orbit, and direct atmospheric entry matter so much. As soon as you start trying to be clever in high Earth orbits on the way back from the moon, or by splitting burns into smaller chunks, you lose that advantage, and the propellant requirements blow up. That's why so many what-if-we-just ideas quietly die once someone actually runs the delta V numbers. Dragon itself is the other hard wall you keep running into. It's an excellent LEO taxi, but it was never meant to be a deep space spacecraft. It can't handle lunar return speeds, it doesn't have the delta V to really help Starship, and once you send it beyond the Van Allen belts or park it in long, stretched out Earth orbits, you suddenly trigger radiation, thermal, and avionics requirements that effectively turn it into a brand new vehicle. NASA's pushback here isn't just conservatism. Even small changes to Dragon snowball into years of testing and certification. That's why the idea looks good on paper, but falls apart in practice. If you rule out lunar refueling, rule out Dragon coming back at lunar speeds, and rule out aero capture, you're forcing Starship to do a fully propulsive Earth capture after leaving the moon, completely on its own. That single choice quietly adds something like three kilometers per second of delta V that just isn't available, even if you refuel again in low Earth orbit or start from a higher orbit. Falcon Heavy, expendable stages, or extra tanks don't really fix it, because the issue isn't how much energy you launch with, it's where that energy has to be applied. Ideas like splitting the Earth return burn or having Dragon meet Starship partway back feel intuitive, but they run straight into the same wall. If Starship slows down enough for Dragon to safely rendezvous, you've already spent most of the energy you were trying to save. Doing it earlier is even worse because the Oberth effect is weaker and every ton of propellant buys you less performance. It feels clever, but the physics is quietly charging interest the entire time. The one idea that almost has real bite is using another large vehicle to give energy to HLS without HLS burning its own propellant, whether that's a second starship or a depot acting like a pusher. It sounds plausible because it actually respects where energy matters in the trajectory. The problem is that docking two Starship-class vehicles and pushing enormous thrust through a docking interface is far beyond anything that's been demonstrated, and any failure would be instantly catastrophic. NASA would treat that as an entirely new, high-risk architecture and demand multiple uncrewed demos before letting astronauts anywhere near it. Don't get me wrong, you can get Dragon to the moon if you really want to, but that would mean serious, though still doable, upgrades that turn Crew Dragon into something much closer to a deep space vehicle. 
If you don't want Dragon to be deep space capable, and you don't want crude refueling in lunar orbit, you're basically left with either hauling Dragon all the way to lunar orbit, or making Starship itself capable of bringing people straight home through the atmosphere. So what's the real solution here? If you strip everything back and look at the requirements honestly, you're asking for a single HLS Starship setup that avoids crude refueling, avoids turning Dragon into a deep space vehicle, avoids crew rating Falcon Heavy, avoids hauling Dragon to the moon, keeps tanker launches low, and still gets the crew home safely. That's an incredibly tight box to fit inside. If the worry is that Starship development itself, especially refueling, could delay later Artemis landings, then there's no workaround that still relies on Starship. You can't fix Starship delays by adding more Starship complexity. In that case, the only real alternatives are SLS and Orion. And if Blue Moon is ready sooner, using that. Those systems exist specifically to bypass Starship risk. But if the concern is the opposite, that SLS and Orion can't support a meaningful cadence and will eventually have to be retired anyway, then the cleanest answer is to lean fully into Starship from the start. A simple, Starship-only architecture. No hybrids, no half-measures. Elon has said for years that Starship is meant to fly the entire Moon mission end-to-end, -end, and this is basically taking that idea seriously instead of trying to dodge it. Direct lunar entry, descent, and landing with Starship won't be reliable overnight. That will take years. Even so, it's probably still the fastest path to a permanent lunar presence, because every workaround adds complexity without really removing risk. That's likely what Elon meant by a simplified mission. Not fewer challenges, but fewer moving parts. When you look at it this way, another pattern jumps out. Lunar orbit refueling keeps coming back, no matter how hard people try to avoid it. Not because it's elegant or convenient, but because it's the least bad place to pay the energy bill. Every alternative looks simpler until you actually add up the propellant, and then it turns out to cost more than it saves. The moon itself helps more than people often realize. Oxygen is abundant there, and oxygen is the heaviest part of the propellant mix. Methane or hydrogen can be shipped from Earth much more efficiently because they're lighter. What the Moon really lacks is carbon. If you want to move carbon to the lunar surface, liquid methane is the simplest option to start with. Kerosene is denser and carries more carbon, and if you really wanted to push efficiency later on, something like a kerosene graphite slurry could move huge amounts of carbon in liquid form, which is far easier than hauling solid carbon blocks. Realistically, early missions would just ship liquid methane and make oxygen locally, then scale up to more efficient methods once demand grows. Any fuel depot, whether it's one or several, will need refrigeration and shade. That sounds intimidating, but it's very doable. Large sunshades can double as solar panels, and the power they generate can be used to re-cool stored oxygen and fuel. With enough propellant stored in a modified Starship depot, you could fully refuel a lunar Starship or even one headed for Mars. For lunar operations, a second depot near something like the Artemis station could top off a lander for descent and then again for the return. None of this is impossible. The real constraint is timing, not physics. Over the long term, you could even imagine a large, slowly spinning fuel depot providing artificial gravity and storing oxygen, methane, and hydrogen for any spacecraft passing through. The other long-term options are spacecraft that use hypergolic propellants purely in space or nuclear-powered systems. Every path has trade-offs, but once you zoom out, the Starship-centric approach stops looking reckless and starts looking inevitable. So, the simplified architecture is basically this. Expendable starships take cargo from low Earth orbit straight to the lunar surface, and a separate, mostly empty starship brings nothing but people back from the moon. The key assumption is that SpaceX makes LEO refueling work. Early on, starship reuse will probably be limited anyway, and SpaceX will have ships that are perfectly fine to throw away as part of development. The numbers actually close in a surprisingly clean way. Getting from LEO to the lunar surface takes around 6 kilometers per second of delta V. Coming back from the moon to Earth takes a bit over 3. With a starship dry mass of about 150 tons, roughly 1,550 tons of propellant, and an RVAC ISP around 370 seconds, the math works. A fully fueled starship in LEO can go one way to the moon and land something like 200 to 225 tons of cargo if you're willing to expend it. 
That's a huge amount of mass per flight. For the return leg, you flip the logic. A starship leaves LEO with no cargo, lands on the moon with about 224 tons of propellant still on board, and then picks up roughly a ton of people and their gear. That's enough to generate just over the 3.2 kilometers per second needed for a direct Earth return, assuming the vehicle can survive re-entry. What makes this interesting is how it fits alongside the existing program instead of trying to replace it. Because Starship isn't human-rated yet, these flights can run in parallel without touching the official Artemis plan. As SpaceX practices refueling, every fully fueled Starship in LEO becomes a lunar landing test article. You can throw low-value cargo on board, food, water, spare equipment, and quietly build up hundreds of tons of supplies on the moon while testing real lunar landings. Any starship that's nearing the end of its useful life after a handful of launches can just become a one-way lunar cargo ship. Artemis keeps going as long as it's ahead of China, and that remains the official path. Meanwhile, Starship is effectively building a lunar warehouse in the background. If at some point China looks like it's about to get there first, a risk-based decision can be made to put people on Starship based on its actual flight record with cargo. That's very similar to how SpaceX approached Dragon. Fly cargo first, learn the system, then add people once confidence is earned. This also gives flexibility in how long crews stay. If Artemis is clearly ahead, you just use Artemis. If China looks like it's pulling ahead, you pivot to Starship. If Starship is ready for Earth re-entry, you send two vehicles. One carries people and cargo down, and a second, empty one, is there to bring them home. If Earth re-entry still isn't trusted, you can send one crewed Starship and rely on the massive stockpile of pre-delivered cargo to support a very long stay until a return vehicle is considered safe. The reason this feels simpler is that it cuts out a lot of interdependencies between vendors and avoids many of the more fragile orbit-to-orbit -orbit refueling schemes. It's not a change in direction, it's a parallel path. You only use it if you have to, but even if you never do, it still supports the original plan by building experience and infrastructure. The mass delivered to the moon acts as a buffer against uncertainty in return technologies.